Wall Street Journal had a story today. In lean times, police cuts spark debate over safety. Join us to talk about this. The editor-in-chief of Officer.com, Mr. Frank Borelli. And Frank, good evening, sir. Thanks for joining us tonight. Good evening, Cam. It's always a pleasure. All right. So what, what was your take on the, uh, uh, the Wall Street Journal article? I mean, this was obviously a story that you're aware of these budget cuts happening all around the country. But uh, now it seems we're finally starting to see some of the national media uh, sit up and take notice of this. And, and aren't they a little bit behind the curve? I mean, <laughs> these budget cuts have only been coming for the last 18 months. I mean, ever since the country essentially went into the economic uh, depression, You've seen this happening, even if it's only through attrition, as, as the one mayor had pointed out, even if it's just not replacing retirees. Uh, we're still seeing shrinking agencies, which means fewer cops on the street per shift, longer response times. Um, yeah, the media should have been, the, the mainstream media should have opened up to this and, and been reporting on it a long time ago. Well, you know, and it's interesting because one of the things that you point out, uh, Mayor Bloomberg has been saying publicly Look, we're not going to be cutting any any uh, jobs uh, or any positions from the NYPD. Uh, okay, and, and that's true technically, uh, but as you point out, officers who are retiring are not being replaced, which means that there are fewer officers on the street, and it, it's been really difficult to get even the New York media to point out something as simple as that. Well, and and it's all sales pitch and, and how you sure. look at it. I mean, the man's the ultimate. A politician. We're not going to lay any cops off. Well, no, you're just not going to replace the ones that retire or you know get fired or whatever, uh, you know, for disciplinary issues, whatever may the case may be. Uh, essentially, it's the same bottom line. You're, you have fewer numbers of police officers on the street uh, to respond to crimes, to suppress crimes, to deter and prevent crimes. Um, ultimately, it means that the average citizen and, and but the courts have been saying this for decades. The law enforcement is not responsible for the individual citizen's safety and well-being. Right. The individual is, uh, you know, and, and I think it's it's a a sad statement about our country today that um, people freak out. Fewer police officers. What am I going to do? Uh, you know. Well, now when you dial nine one one instead of waiting for seven and a half minutes, you're going to wait for eight and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, how about you just accept responsibility for your own safety and and do what you need to do to protect yourself and your family. Well, and you know what's interesting? I mean, we have seen public officials uh, uh, say, "All right, it might be time for you to uh, purchase a firearm." Uh, sadly, though, you know th there are a lot of there are a lot of big city mayors, Frank, and I think most of them are big city mayors who will never ever say that. Uh, first of all, they they refuse, I think, to accept the idea that an individual is responsible for his or her own safety. Uh, you look at the story that happened in uh, New York over the weekend, the, the tragic story of a guy who came to the aid of a, a woman who was being mugged. The guy got stabbed. He collapsed and lay on the ground for more than an hour before somebody called 911. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, if that doesn't tell you that you're responsible for your own safety, even if you've been stabbed, you can't rely on your fellow citizens to, uh, you know, do a simple thing like call 911. Uh, they'll take out their phone and use it to take a picture of you laying on the ground, but they're not going to call 911. But, but look at how that started, Cam. Yeah. Guy goes to help somebody yeah. and ends up, Stabbed and laying on a sidewalk, and the mainstream media has played this for how many days in a row this has been on television, and they're showing this video and showing the video, beating it into the ground. What's the lesson that we all learn from that? This is what you get when you try to help somebody. Right. So don't try to help anybody. Oh, yeah. Oh, come on. How the heck does this work? Um, how about mm, – I won't even go there. <laughs> <laughs> Some things I really shouldn't say on the radio. But well, I do think you're right. That you get a lot of these big city mayors, and they and they don't want people to accept responsibility for themselves. I think there comes a point uh, when you reach a certain level in politics where you really have to buy into the fact that you're there to help take care of the people. Uh, and all of us like to help people. You know, if your next door neighbor needs assistance and you can reach out that helping hand, you're going to do it. Uh, but there's a difference between helping them do something for themselves and taking care of them because they're incapable or you think they're incapable. That's right. That's right. And, and I think that they reach that point where they just don't think that the commoners can take care of themselves and they, they need to take them by the hand and show them the right way to go. Yeah, I, I think you're right. But, you know, you, you pointed something out, Frank, uh, in terms of the media coverage of that, uh, I just think, horrible thing that happened in, uh, in New York City. Uh, Good Morning America had a piece on this yesterday, and they, they talked to a psychologist uh, who said, and this is a quote here, 
The cycle of apathy can be broken, uh, starting by teaching children to grow up to be compassionate adults, psychologist Bradley said. He suggested exposing them to new people or situations through community service and helping them to think critically about news stories, such as the incident in New York. He says, quote, we have to show our kids caring, empathy, and involvement. You don't have to be a hero. You don't have to jump into the fight. Just push three buttons. That is 911. First of all, I'm a little insulted, uh, and I'm and I'm terrified if this is actual advice that is helpful to people hey if you want your kids to uh, have empathy teach them empathy i i wouldn't think that this would be something frank that you would actually need to go on national television and uh, explain to people oh well he's getting paid to be on national television <laughs> explain to people or he's selling books or something come on but i you know he <laughs> also, look, he look, also Cam, I've, I've got this... kids you you start at a young age teaching yes i want my kids to be to, to have empathy i want them to be compassionate and, and I wish I could remember who made the quote, but somebody once said that the best warriors were compassionate warriors because they did what they did out of care and concern. You can be an empathetic, compassionate person and still not be a willing victim and roll over to the wolves on the street. Absolutely. And, and that's what I try to teach my kids, and, and, and I, I may have said this to you before. Look, if you can walk away from the fight, walk away from it. If you can't walk away, talk your way out of it. If you can't walk, you can't talk, win. And then tell us about it afterwards. Yeah, you know. But th- this whole let's let's be warm and caring. Let's well, let's all hug each other and sing kumbaya. But the guy with the <laughs> knife is going to win. Uh, we can't go there. Well, no, we can't. And and you know, I think Frank uh, around the country, I think we're starting to see a recognition, perhaps not by the elected officials yet, uh, but certainly by you know average everyday Americans who uh, perhaps live in cities with these restrictive gun control laws. And they're told that it's the next gun control law that, that's going to work. It's the next one that's going to make them safer. And in the meantime, we keep seeing stories about these repeat career criminals who shouldn't be out, uh, but uh, who are either, you know, getting these slaps on the wrist. Or I ran across a story. I haven't had time to get to this tonight. Somebody with a uh, rap sheet, you know, a, a mile long, uh, who uh, is out on bail, uh, apparently tries to bribe a juror. And uh, when when that doesn't work, she just fails to show up for her sentence. And now there's a warrant out for her arrest. This is a uh, woman in in Colorado uh, who has she's a multi-state offender with a lengthy criminal history, including arrest for fraud, assault, larceny and perjury. She was, uh, you know, again on trial uh, for weapons possession and reckless endangerment. And she was out on seventy five thousand dollar bail. Which only cost her seventy five hundred dollars exactly to some bail bonds, and, 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 and it, I would take <laughs> bets from people that she will add another state to her multi state list of, of, of felonies and crimes because she'll just go to the next one over until she gets caught on a warrant. There. Sure, you know, and so when we keep when we keep seeing these politicians say, "Well, the way to make our city streets safer, Frank, is to uh, you know go after the law abiding people who aren't breaking the law and put more restrictions on them," when we keep seeing these stories, I got to think Americans are getting a little fed up by this. I think so, too, but I also think that's why you're seeing uh, some of the other laws being passed or, or some of them being voided where uh, – and I can't remember where it was. It just recently uh, – well, number one, you have all these states you know, that are doing the freedom – the firearms freedom laws where they're saying, hey, federal government, sorry, you know, interstate commerce isn't getting this, number one. We're keeping them in our state, so take a flying leap. Uh, number two, concealed carry being approved, you know, all, all the shall issue laws that have come up across the country, mm-hmm. uh, the open carry laws that are now being passed, the, 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 the gradually reducing restrictions on people who can lawfully carry to defend themselves, I, that, that, gives, that makes me feel warm. I, I, I take faith in the, in the fact that the country can be going the right direction. Well, I think in terms of our Second Amendment rights, uh, it is. And, and quite honestly, Frank, you know, violent crime – while it may be ticking up in places like New York uh, this year, violent crime across the country still at 40-year lows, even as we have, you know, uh, the most gun owners in U.S. history. We've got six million right to carry holders around the country. It really is, I think, a, uh, a more guns, less crime environment these days. Absolutely, but, but there is a definitive connection between gun laws and, and crime reduction. The fewer gun laws we have that restrict, you know, our lawful adult citizens from carrying. Mm-hmm. In other words, the, the more people we have legally carrying able to defend themselves, the lower our crime rates grow. Now, you want to look at New York. I think it's a very 
uh, weird particular place to live. I mean, you, you want to talk, and I don't mean offense to anybody who lives in New York, <laughs> but you put more and more citizens into a, a more confined space, and we humans tend to lose our minds. I mean, we're not rats in a maze. That's not how we're supposed to live. And you put that many people on top of each other, you have problems, and then you reduce the number of police officers you have on the streets. You put all kinds of insane laws. I mean, now they're trying to regulate how much sugar can, can go in, in your food. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it gets a little bit silly, and people don't – I can't believe that the citizens of New York look at Bloomberg and really believe that in his heart of hearts he is so concerned about their well-being that he's trying to control the minutia of their day. I, I just don't think they buy it. And I think that's where across the country we're seeing people look at politicians and go, you know – we know what you're really after. More power, more money, and we're a little bit tired of it. Mm -hmm. You're not doing the job you're supposed to. Let's move on the way we're supposed to. All right, so getting back to the issue of these budget cuts, Frank, I mean, how bad, do you, A, do you think it's going to get worse, and B, how bad do you think it's going to get for some cities? Um, pretty bad. Well, A, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better, and B, I think it can get pretty bad. It's going to depend. We need to remember that almost – well, most of the police officers in this country are municipal police officers. They work for cities. Yeah, there's the county. Yeah, there's the state. But the large majority of them work for cities, and those cities get their income either from income tax, sales tax, property tax, some combination of the three. You look at what happened to the real estate market, property tax revenue is way down for these municipalities. Income tax revenue, because of the increasing unemployment rate, is way down for a lot of these municipalities. So they have a lot less money to work with, and the federal government doesn't have them the money to work with either. So they're not getting the grant dollars that they thought they might or that might be available. They don't have any choice but to cut services. And then how does a politician look good while they cut services? Uh, you know, you cut police, and, and it, it's almost acceptable to some people. You know, it was funny. I was, I was with the chief of police the other day. And we went on a home invasion call, and while we're there with the victims of this home invasion, a guy comes up who's, who wants to run for mayor in this particular city. Mm -hmm. And the first thing out of his mouth was that he would get rid of the corrupt police officers in this city. Now, mind you, I'm standing there with the chief of police. <laughs> really interesting situation, but that's what some politicians, they know, hey, these, these citizens, if they've had a bad experience with the cops, you can cut the police, and some of these citizens are okay with that. Yeah. Most especially some of the criminals. They're really happy with that. Sure. They'll be glad to vote for you. But I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, I think you, if, even if it started to turn around today, you'd see a year or two recovery time, in my opinion. And in wow. that time, the citizens are still going to have to – well, because you've got to get the cities to stabilize, and then you have to get them hiring again. And then once they start hiring, you have the entire time lag of accepting applications, doing the backgrounds, processing everybody, and then a six-month police academy. So how long is it going to be before your numbers go back when you're putting uniforms on the street? Um, there, there's going to be a big lag. Um, in the meantime, the citizens are the ones that are going to have to accept safety. And they're going to have to work with their neighbors. You know, the, the criminals still have to be stopped someplace, and, yeah. and it's going to be – the bottom line is going to be where it's always been when we don't delude ourselves. The lawful American citizen not willing to be a victim. Frank Borelli, editor-in-chief of Officer.com. Thank you, as always, sir, for uh, joining us on the program. A real pleasure getting a chance to talk with you tonight. Cam, it's always a blast. Thanks, man. Thank you, sir. We'll do it again soon. Uh, Frank Borelli, editor-in-chief of Officer.com with us.